You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to another edition of Answers for the Family. <laughs> I'm getting back. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza. And for those of you that have been listening, sending in questions and comments, thank you so much. And please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases, entertain, while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. And I would really appreciate it if you could all do me a favor. Please forward one of our shows to your social media groups and to someone you know that can benefit from a particular show. And I guarantee you, you're all going to know somebody that can benefit from this show. Now, Answers for the Family will continue to address a variety of issues, such as looking your runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and just creating greater health happiness, and so much more. Now, we'll introduce you to talented authors and new innovations in the areas of health, security, and in some cases, fun for you and your family. Now, before we get to our guest, thank you. And this is to all of you that take your precious time to listen to this show, and especially those that send in questions, comments, and suggestions. And we've received some insightful feedback and recent requests to address elementary age children. Well, my wonderful producer found an incredible expert and an author on the subject. So our topic today, which is also the title of her new book, is The Emotionally Healthy Child, helping your child calm, center, and make smarter choices. Our guest, Maureen Healy, is also the author of Growing Happy Kids, which won the Nautilus and Reader's Favorite Book Awards in 2014. She's a popular Psychology Today blogger and sought-after public speaker. Maureen runs a global mentoring program for elementary-aged children and works with parents and their children in her very busy private practice. Her expertise in social and emotional learning has taken her all over the world, including working with Tibetan refugee children at the base of the Himalayas in northern India to classrooms right here in California. Maureen, welcome to Answers for the Family. Thank you for having me. Well, it, it was it was great to be able to go through your book and look at all of the wonderful ways in which you're reaching our young people. So let me ask you this. What inspired you to write The Emotionally Healthy Child? That's a great question. Uh, you know, working with children, I just saw kids over and over again in my office who smart, capable kids, but they just are very emotionally reactive. So, I mean, that's really where most of us start, slamming doors and screaming and, and doing sort of not so skillful ways of handling our emotions. But when I explained how emotions work and gave them some tools, they did better. So I wanted to share that information with a broader audience. Well, so how, how do you define an emotionally healthy child? So again, you're right on with these questions. Very good. So an emotionally healthy child, I would explain as a child who's learning how to identify his or her emotions and expressing them constructively. So um, they're not running from their emotions. They're not hiding. They're not suppressing them with ignoring them with like video games and lots of candy, although kids do that. And if your child does that, doesn't mean they're emotionally unhealthy. That's just not what positive emotional health is. So learning positive emotional health, a child's not only identifying their emotions, they're learning how to identify them when they're small, sort of take a beat, and then express them constructively. So instead of pushing the kid on the playground, you learn how to walk away, those kind of things. Well, in your uh, your earlier book, you focused on happier children. So at this point, you're now going into the emotionally healthy child. How do those two work together where being emotionally healthy actually makes you happier? Yeah, my book, Growing Happy Kids, is about confidence, which is sort of the foundation for deeper happiness. But, you know, we have to be courageous and brave in order to face emotions, particularly children, because uncomfortable or challenging emotions are hard if you don't know how to handle them. So anger or frustration So having that courage 
to face uncomfortable things, whether it's jealousy, feeling left out. You know, science proves that children feel, you know, a whole array of emotions. By two years old, they know what shame and guilt are. So my first book really talks about how to develop that deeper sense of confidence for happiness. And this book talks about, again, how do you manage emotions? How do you identify and express them constructively so that we can be whole and authentic on our path to becoming happier? You say that there's three simple steps that have the power to change everything when it comes to emotional health. What are they and why are they so important? Right. Yes. It's, I mean, they're, they're simple conceptually, but obviously in practice they're harder. But the idea is to, one, stop teaching our children how to catch themselves before they go through down a not so fast step. Two, calm. Um, especially if they're feeling a challenging emotion. But even if they're feeling you know, uh, enthusiasm or overexcited, you want to kind of come back to center and calm. And then three, you want to make a smart choice. So I define a smart choice as a choice good for you and good for others. For example, I had a, I had a child who got really angry and threw something across her classroom. That was good for her, but it was not good for others. So <laughs> something to slow down and stop and take a beat and then make a smarter choice is important. Okay, but so how should, let's say in that situation of a classroom, um, it's great to be able to get them to, to slow down and to make a better choice when they've already made that bad choice. How do you then look to the adult in the room to handle um, the making of that choice, especially if it's in a classroom and it's in front of other kids? Well, I think the goal in classrooms, as as we sort of know with all the science and research, is that we have to proactive and helping children manage their emotions because if we don't help them with their emotions, we can't get to the academics. So a child that was having a challenging day and made a mistake, like throwing something, I mean, that's handled on a case-by-case basis. But certainly, you know, I think that we don't help children correct by shame or blame. We, We help everyone in the classroom learn how to, you know, manage their emotions, whether it's through mindfulness or social and emotional learning. But we do at least one thing a day in the classroom to help children come back to center and calm because, you know, just even running outside at recess, things happen and you get you know, frustrated and, you know, helping, giving kids tools is, is and, and also, I mean, that's why I wrote the book. I explained how emotions work and strategies that work for a child because a child's mind is very different than adults. So things land differently. So we want to explain in their language, how do I, you know, catch myself and slow down? So that's where, um, you know, getting sort of fresh strategies is helpful. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's good advice for all of us, I think, at any age. I think there, there there are many times in which if there's not somebody there to kind of catch us, you know, we all uh, at times have made a mistake or something, and we look back and go, wow, if I would have just taken a moment and thought, right. probably wouldn't have done that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And that's the biggest feedback I get on the book, The Emotionally Healthy Child. Like, forget my children. This is good for me. And, of course. You know, the more we can keep our emotional houses in order and role model, the better everyone is. Well, yes, you uh, you got that right. Um, we have mm-hmm. uh, we have an uh, instant message coming in from a listener, uh, and again, I want to thank those that take the time to do this. Uh, this one reads: My daughter's two children, ages five and eleven, are the most amazing kids. Smart, funny, well behaved, and then in parentheses, for now that is. <laughs> it says, mm-hmm. but they're very attached to their electronics. I'm worried because they seem to have no interest in the outdoors, in nature, or just playing outside. I recently read a study that predicts uh, the next generation will be weaker and less healthy uh, when they become adults if they continue these current patterns and behaviors of remaining indoors and focusing on electronics. Um uh, you put the two words together, emotionally healthy, and they're in quotes. Um, but doesn't uh, health in general play a big part in being emotionally healthy? I would like to buy your book for my daughter and myself. Uh, do you address this specific to- topic? And this is from Patrice in Virginia. Yes, I actually do talk about screens and, and you know, screen screens and device time in my book because it and it's a great question by the way um, because it is a it is a challenge 
Um, there is also a movie that I like called Screenagers. It's a documentary. I talk about it in the book, but it shows how, you know, children do, can become addicted or because there is a physiological response in their, in their brain, you know, all these feel good chemical goes when they get that instant satisfaction off devices. So it is yeah. really important to help them have a healthy relationship with that so that they can enjoy life. I mean, the, kind of the caveat that I have, and this is not an excuse, but I always think, you know, children are born for another time. So if you know, 30 years, it's going to be a different world. So, the, you know, it's not like things, things are just only getting more tech, tech savvy. But there is balance, which is why, you know, emotional health is the skill of balance. So helping them balance different parts of their life and come back to center is so important for physical, emotional, and mental, social health. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm a left-hander, so I've, uh, I've made jokes many times about the fact that, you know, I might be the only person in my right brain, or at least uh, those of us that are left-handed. But I know you talk about in the book, you say that, that helping our emotional or the right brain, um, that, that children, that it brings their, their reason and their logic or that left brain side into the decision-making equation, and that it's central to raising emotionally healthy children. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So as most of us know, the right brain is considered the part of the brain that's very emotional and the left brain is more logical, has logic and reason. And, you know, that's sort of simplified, but it's helpful to learn. And then, you know, the best decisions are made, integrated decisions where we're using the right and the left side of our brain together. So, so there's exercises in the book and ideas how to bring on the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain so children can make better choices. Mm-hmm. And logic, the left side, really comes online for four years old and up. So some kids, certainly three years old, every child is different. But in general, four years, four years old and up, we can start really emotionally coaching and guiding them on how to make these better choices. Now, and why is it that it's that age? What is it that in the brain that, uh, from a development standpoint, uh, that makes that a a good time to start? Well, just, you know, you you know, spending time with a toddler, they're beautiful, wonderful beings, (laughs) but um, not really reasonable. (laughs) So it's just part of development, that brain development, that around, and every child is different, certainly. But three, four-year-olds, you know, that's why they start preschool around that age because you can, um, it goes from me to more of a we, hopefully. You can see the context of yourself and others and, and uh, your, your judgment and prefrontal cortex is really uh, beginning more. Yeah, no, and, and, and that makes good sense. It's just as you were saying that, I was smiling and thinking about those parents that are out there with the two-year-olds going, isn't there something we can do? Right. No, and that's a good question. I guess I would say to that is that, you know, we all know, especially children, they start in their right brain. When you're hungry, you cry. When you need something, you make people let people know. But children are great readers of energy and emotion. So, you know, they really will mimic us. So that's why it's so important to learn how emotions work and how to handle them constructively because kids, you know, the magic of mirror neurons is that Science shows that when you're in the presence of someone else, it's easier to learn something if they've already know that. So if your mom or dad knows how to calm, even when they're really frustrated, a child has a better chance of learning that faster. So that's what you can do. You can really role model as much as possible. And we're not perfect. We're not supposed to be perfect, but, you know, we do our best. You know, I I, I love the fact that you brought up the thing about mimicking the parents. Um, You know, I was so focused on that when my kids were that age that I actually, I wrote a rap and, and at the talent show in school had, had my, um, you know, grade school age kids and a couple of their friends do a rap, but we wrote the rap that essentially was the kids telling all the parents in the audience, all the things that they're going to do to mimic them. So it, you know, mm-hmm. as they're, they're doing it in the form of a rap, so it made it kind of entertaining, but at the same time, mm-hmm. it was sending a message to the parents that when you do this, that's what we see. So that's what we think is the way to go. And I was told afterwards, actually, by some of the teachers and stuff that they said that, uh, you know, they wished that 
that they had better ways to get through to the parents because they see so many of the kids mimicking behaviors that they feel is counterproductive. Mm-hmm. Right. And that makes sense. I'm sorry, what's that? I said that makes sense. You know, we oh. have to find sort of creative and fun ways to engage children and adults so that we can learn in a way that works. Well, and, and I know you talk about it in, in your book, The Emotionally Healthy Child. You say that they, they can learn uh, they can learn how to use any of their own experience as fodder. So more than just mimicking what the parents are doing, um, they can go in and use their own experience and hopefully do it in such a way so that it's for a positive emotional help. So uh, I know you go into it a little deeper in your book. Elaborate a little more on that point. Well, I mean, yeah, the whole the whole idea is that there's no emotional experience that needs to be wasted, that we can help our children early on. You know, some days it feels like we have lemons, but we can certainly do our best to make lemonade. But, you know, the child who is devastated because they failed their spelling quiz or the other child who is devastated because they didn't make the basketball team. So learning how to use those experiences and grow from them so it's really having that growth mindset, not only that grit or what I would call inner confidence, but being able to say, okay, this is a bummer, I'm sad. You know, it's not deny your feelings, experience them, let them go through you, but how can I, you know, get up and learn more and do better? So, you know, it's when we feel our best that we, you know, do our best. So helping children learn that, you know, failure is not final or fatal, you know, that, that learning how to just take things and make the best of them. and continue to move forward. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I have some strategies in the book about, you know, being mindful in the present moment, but also looking forward and helping kids, a lot of kids get stuck in the past. So giving them some tools to help them not only develop optimism, but begin to realize that, you know, nobody can do it for them. They're the, they, they can start steering their emotional boats towards, um, you know, uh, calmer or happier seas. So, and if, if, go ahead and give us an example. I know you, you have an example. I think you use the girl Delilah uh, just as an example of some of the tools or some of the things that parents can do um, to help promote the positive rather than focusing so much on the negative. Well, I mean, I think I'll give you one example. I have what I call, I believe it's called the wheel of feel, but it's like, for example, say, you know, a child was going to a new school, right? And they're really nervous or they're upset or they're anxious. So you can take a piece of paper out, create a circle like a pizza pie, divide it into eight slices, and in each slice, help a child move from wherever they're feeling to just a slightly a little bit better. You can't go from being miserable to joyous, but you can just start moving in the right direction. And, for example, the child says, you know, maybe in the middle of the wheel you write, I'm nervous, I started a new school. So, okay. So, okay, let's start right here. You know, you start to be a little more positive. Okay, um, this school has good extracurricular activities. They have soccer that I want to do. Okay, that's positive. I might need a new best friend. Okay, that's positive. I get to not wear uniforms and pick my own clothes. That's positive. So helping them begin to focus on the the things that feel good and that, that are helpful to them is it's a skill to be learned. And that's what I would say about emotional health. You know, you don't, you're not born with great genes, or you could be. It's always helpful. But it's a skill to be learned. Any healthy adult, or, you know, any healthy adult or child can learn the skill of, of emotional health. It's not um, something you're born with. No, and I, I like that. And I, I like the fact of bringing up other positive things. Uh, I know that right now, you know, I, I believe that we're in an era of you know, between the, you know, the media and everything that's going on out there, it's a matter of, you know, how much negative can we dump on everybody? You know, how can we, you know, it's, it's interesting and it's, it's in everything. It used to be, maybe it was just when it was political, but now it's everything. It's the weather. So in other words, we're not going to have, we don't have, we, it seems like we never have like really good weather. You know, if it's, it's either, it's either, too hot or it's too cold or it's going to be too windy or it and it, it's not going to be that we're going to have high winds we're going to have you know you know hurricanes that are going to cause death i mean all of these things so with the kids getting so much of this dumped on them i love the fact that you're talking about how can you now point out so many of the other positives that are around them and i think that's our 
our job as parents. You know, we're, we're not going to be able to completely control all of that that's going on out there. But when we do have the time with them, pointing out those things you bring up, I think, is huge. Thanks. Yeah, and it's not even about control, about coaching them. So helping them begin to form these habits that not only help in second and third grade, but that tend to lifelong habits because they are forming a mindset. And I talk about the emotionally healthy mindset in the book. So you want them to begin forming that mindset where they take responsibility, where they learn how to steer themselves in the right direction. And eventually, obviously, we want them to be self-reliant. But these small steps, which may not seem like a lot to adults, it's huge for children. And also, I think that um, it's not asking to spend more time, just some tips and ideas from the book. You can just use your time very effectively with children. Well, another thing you bring up in the book is is you talk about wholeness is more important than right. happiness. So uh, explain right. that. I, I, I thought it was really interesting, but I also think it would be great for all the listeners to hear the reasoning behind that. Sure. Well, I mean, happiness or feeling happier is pretty darn important. So I'm not going to say that's not important, but that's not the goal. The goal is to be a whole human being, to be to feel all of your feelings, you know, to feel sad and grief when those things happen, to feel joy when those things happen, to feel grateful, you know, as much as possible. So the idea is we want to help our children be able to face any of their emotions and learn how to express them constructively. And we know as adults, when we're with someone who is honest and authentic, and it's not just putting on a happy face, we have a better relationship. We feel more authentic. There's more meaning in our lives. We want to help children be authentic beings and experience all of their emotions. Um, so I think the idea is that wholeness, because you don't want to always, you know, when you're with someone who just always puts on a happy face, you don't really feel like there's a real connection there. So you want children to, you know, be have enough courage to face whatever they're feeling, but also to develop those strong, positive, authentic connections that help them live a healthier and happier life. And like I said, it's not all sunshines and unicorns. There are days that just, you know, are challenging days, and that's okay, too. But learning how to begin again and to start over is really helpful as well. Well, and and I agree with that. And then there's a story, actually, that I've told. Uh, I think I told it on the air before. Um, but we do need to know how to deal with all of those other things that may happen because that's what life brings. And uh, the story of uh, um, Freddie Prince uh, senior um, Mm -hmm. who, who committed suicide, but um, there was some, some people that had been around him and they said that, you know, nobody could believe this because he was so incredibly happy. But what they said was he had never dealt with any form of of difficulty because he was he was good looking he was he was uh, really funny he ended up you know, at a very young age he got a television career and mm-hmm. everything came to him so easily that he had never had to deal with anything and when a girlfriend broke up with him he thought it was the end of the world and killed himself you know so i i agree with you we we do need to go through life and be whole and part of being whole is we need to be able to deal with the things that are going to come at us in life. Right. So, and I guess the only tidbit I'd add on to that is when, when children have challenges early on, I always say it's a good thing because they are learning early on how to overcome obstacles. That's yeah. like you said, it will help them their whole lives. They're, you know, when you get older and you say, oh, I've done that, I can handle that. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and when we're, you know, in, in grade school and the little girl doesn't want to hold our hand when we walk, okay, that may seem crushing at that moment, but we're learning something that may make it better when it happens when we're 20 years old. Uh, right. So uh, right. we're going to take, take a break. We're going to be right back. Um, now, for those of you, if you're at your computer, if you want to open up another screen, if you want to follow along with us, um, uh, you can go to uh, www.growinghappykids.com. Uh, so that's uh, Maureen's website. Uh, you can look at the the books and the blogs and, and everything about what she's doing. If you're in your car, obviously you can't do this, uh, but you can go to our site. You can go to the Answers for the Family site. You'll be able to uh, gain all of that information. So stay with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. 
founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis. West Shield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Our guest today is Maureen Healy, and her new book, The Emotionally Healthy Child, is full of practical tools for parents, teachers, and professionals to teach children about how to do it in a healthy way to so that they can express their emotions. Uh, now, um, Maureen, can you share with us just a couple of these tools with us that you have in the book? Sure. I'll give you a tool that I think is helpful for any family. Um, you know, when I work with children and they make, you know, they have done something that maybe wasn't so helpful to them, often we talk about smart choices, a choice that's good for you and good for others. So maybe good for you is screaming because you feel immediate anger relief, but maybe not good for the family or even the neighbors, you know. So what I, one tool I have in the book is called the Smart Choices Checklist. And it's something that I have found that it really helps children. It, it lands in their mind and they immediately get it. So we talk about, you know, if you're frustrated or angry or not feeling perfect, like what, what are the smart choices? What can you go do at home? Like list three to five things and what are the things that you can do at school? For example, at school, you might be able to take a bathroom break and throw water on your face. Maybe you may talk to your teacher. You may draw in your journal. You may go to the library. You know, every school is different. Identifying, you may take deep breaths, but identifying the things that you can do to calm and come back to center is important. And then maybe at home you read your favorite book or go under a tree or listen to your favorite song or do some yoga or tai chi. You know, children Mm -hmm. that identify what they can do and then you post that smart choices checklist in their room or their personal space. And then, you know, you can direct them. Hey, it looks like you're, you know, when you see them getting triggered or maybe going in a direction, say, why don't you go there and pick something out and they go, Oh, I can go jump on the trampoline. I'll feel better. Okay, great. So you're teaching them how to direct themselves. Yeah, I love it. And yeah. And it's interesting. I'm, um, I'm in a, um, a studio right now and I have things posted in huge letters on each side, such as live inspired, live well, live happy, live health, Mm -hmm. live bold. Mm -hmm. Um, and and some of the things that are that were also posted in my kids' rooms um, were motivational posters, such as you know, there's one I'm looking around now, one that says risk, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, winners don't wait, you know, you know, mm-hmm. they take the opportunity. Um, so yes, I, I think that's great to be able to post things on how to deal with that. Uh, whatever it is, it might be a very small thing, but it keeps it from becoming a very big thing just by doing one of those things, be it walking away or using their words or, or deep breathing. Um, so I love it. Mm-hmm. So we, and we, we have a, we have an email uh, question and comment in here. This one reads um, such a great title um, that could not be more timely. Uh, I live close to a very large high school and junior high school complex. Um, uh, These young people um, are rowdy at times. They can get very loud, and as they travel in packs in the evenings and sometimes as late as 1 a.m. or later, uh, the attitudes seem to have changed, and it's all happened uh, from as little as 10 years ago. I really don't feel safe 
in the same place any longer as I did just 10 years ago. Uh, things are being stolen out of our yard, bikes, chairs, and whatever. There's been problems in the neighborhood with vandalism and graffiti, uh, liquor bars, I'm sorry, liquor bottles, and even needles have been found. Um, you know, I believe these are emotionally unhealthy kids, um, and the numbers seem to be growing. I was wondering what you see our future, and how can someone like me make a difference? And this is from Debbie in Los Angeles. Right. That's a very good question. And, you know, I am extremely optimistic, but that's also because I get to go into the classrooms and teach kids at an early age about how emotions work and and what we can do to make those smart choices. But, you know, I realize that, you know, NPR and lots of different places, you know, there have reported over 25 percent of children in elementary, middle and high school have significant mental health, emotional health disorders, anxiety, depression, and we're talking serious issues. And that's probably, to be honest, even a low number. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is a challenge out there, and it is it is somewhat by geography. It is somewhat by, you know, it's a product of our society. You know, we have a lot of people have different family systems that have sort of broken down. So, I mean, I think that being proactive and doing the work that I do and people like me do to help the next generation get a better handle on their emotional health. I don't think it's a nice to have. I think it's a must have. Um, and then it feels like where you are, you're experiencing, you know, sort of the, the byproduct of a lot of these different challenges. It's sort of a sophisticated problem, but a lot of different challenges. And what can you do? I mean, besides move, you know, I mean, I think that be, you know, advocating for, you know, some sort of um, after school activities. We have things where I live, where in California, I know you're in LA, but I'm a little bit outside of LA, where they have teen programs. I mean, I think there is that at risk, you know, middle school and teens that if they are not going in a constructive di- direction, you're right, they're not going in a destructive direction. And since they are old enough to make bigger choices, drugs, alcohol, pregnancy, all these other things, you know, there there can be real problems. So I think bringing in the right people, I guess, is the right solution. And what that means is sort of, you know, I can't really, from where I sit, know exactly what's going on in your in your area. But I would connect with the school. I would connect with the community. I would raise a flag and say, hey, this is not something that we want in our community. We need to work on making moving this in a, in a better direction. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, and I I think that's great advice. Um, As I was reading the question and I was thinking that I think many of us, um, and I'm in a situation to where, you know, my main company does crisis intervention and adolescent transport of at-risk youth. So we are, we are constantly working with uh, some of the kids who have already made some bad choices. And the, the positive side of that is, is we're taking them somewhere where, uh, they're going to have a better chance to make some better choices. But you can also get, you know, our own mind can get very, you know, negative if if that's all we're seeing. You know, if we're working all day mm-hmm. and we come home and all we're seeing are the, you know, the empty beer bottles or whatever laying around. So, yes, just what you said, I think, is wonderful. I mean, volunteer at that school if you have time, because then you're going to see the other kids and you're not only going to see the ones that either make the news or or leave stuff in your yard you're going to see you know volunteer if you're into music volunteer to work with the you know the the music uh class if you're into sports volunteer to work with with one of the sports teams that you like and you'll see that it's 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 not the majority you know it, it isn't what it appears although the media and and what is kind of being found right in front of you may make it look that way it really isn't and once you're around those other kids and you're around the ones it makes you it it reinvigorates you when you go yeah we're going to make it because look at these kids i just went and and listened to these kids speak and they're in the you know the the government class and they're talking about the changes that they want to see that makes me feel better or in the music class and and listening to, to them you know, make beautiful music and talk about their passion for it. I think that will that will help. You know, not only uh, you know Debbie in this case, but anybody that's that's feeling like they're only seeing the worst of what's out there. 
Mm -hmm. And the only other thing I'd add to that is that, you know, when kids are making poor choices, it's like adults who make poor choices. It it doesn't feel good for you either. They want to make better choices. They just either don't have the role models or they don't realize that there are other options out there or they're hanging around with the quote unquote wrong crowd. So, you know, bringing in people that can help them, I think is why I think there's it's such value to have such a diversity of teachers. You know, there's always someone for someone. Mm-hmm. And and I think you, you talk about it in your book because, I, you, you know, you said if, if we don't learn how to slow down and stop in the middle of any form of, of a habitual pattern or behavior, nothing's right. going to change. So how can we right. teach our children to learn how to catch themselves in those situations? Right. It's, that's very good. That's very good. And that's where, you, you know, you do need someone from the outside to help them, you know, see other options and learn to catch themselves. And that's why I think any sort of mindfulness is valuable, even though kids may shirk at it. I mean, if there can be something, there's some sort of tool for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so punishment it, doesn't work. So, you know, if you're going to school and you're just getting demerits and detentions, so that's only going to, you know, reinforce the problem. So helping giving them an out and helping to see a child best and giving them a path. And that means different things for different people. But, you know, holding that hope for some kids, I think, is huge. Yeah, and you bring up a good point about the detentions and the demerits and, and, and all the focus right. being on those negative things. One of the things that I loved, uh, I was a room dad, and and the teacher that, that my kids were able to first be um, introduced to, a, a kindergarten teacher, and and. She made and made us as the room parents part of it, but it was the catch them doing something good. And mm-hmm. so if, if you know, um, Sammy is over here in the corner and they're um, doing something that they're not supposed to be doing, you know, they the, and the teacher told us as as room parents, you know, instantly look around because the teacher just said for everybody to come sit up front, you know, because she's about to read something and, and, and find, you know, find Johnny who's sitting in the front, you know, and go, I just want to recognize Johnny because as soon as she said that he's up there, he's sitting there, his hands are folded and look, so is Kathy. Kathy's sitting up there and start recognizing those kids that are doing the right thing and then see what happens with Sammy. See if Sammy doesn't realize that he's not getting any attention by being over there, you know, uh, you know, pouring glue on the wrong paper or something that he's not supposed to be doing. Um, but yeah, I love the fact that what you're saying is, is that, you know, let's, let's not make this a thing about, you know, demerits and taking away um, or, or trying to embarrass or, or somehow make them feel bad about what it is that they're doing. Mm-hmm. So now you, one of the things that you talk about also in the book is you go into mindfulness um, and you talk about it as being a central theme. Um, you know, how does it relate to raising the emotionally healthy child? Because I think it's something that, I mean, as an adult, you know, we're, we're learning to be more mindful and it's being brought out more um, into the mainstream. I love the fact that in your book, you make it something that we're talking about, you know, right from the get go, start them early. Um, I think that's great. But so share a little bit more about um, actually how you came to believe that that was the answer to start them early in that area. Well, there are certain things that are accelerators of emotional health. And uh, of course, finding a teacher who's very emotionally healthy. And by that, I mean, it could be your parents, it could be anyone, you know, being able to mimic someone, a mentor. And also the idea of mindfulness, although it sounds like a fancy Eastern word, it just means paying attention. And of course, it means paying attention in a certain way without judgment. So, you know, you could learn how to be like, I'm angry. And, you know, you identify what's going on. But the idea is that, you know, that paying attention, when you pay attention, and as a child, you learn to pay attention early. And, um, you know, even for the example of learning, you know, what are your small anger triggers? So one child I work with, he knew that when he, you know, clasped his hand into a fist, he was starting to get angry. So, okay, even though he's seven, he can realize when I do that, I'm getting angry. So boiling over like a volcano, I can 
you know, take a deep breath. I can go to my smart choices checklist. I can make a different choice. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. you can begin to learn how emotions work. So the idea is that if we don't pay attention, like you said before, you know, we just keep doing what we're doing. We have these knee-jerk reactions that are more careless, but we want our children to make, you know, better, more careful choices. And that's where the paying attention or the mindfulness comes in. And you can, you can have fun with mindfulness. You can do mindful car washing. You can do mindful setting the table. You can do mindfulness of gardening. You can teach mindfulness in a variety of ways. But I think one of the core pieces of the puzzle, from my perspective, is slowing down. Um, a lot of kids, they just, their mind moves quickly, their bodies move quickly, they can, you know, run into a wall. You know, you want them to slow down and begin to become more mindful and pay attention. Not that they don't, you know, run when they're on the football field, but, you know, they can learn how to slow down. And when you slow down, you actually make better choices and get to where you want to be quicker. So uh, the practice of mindfulness. And I also, I would add that you know, I would say that we're learning together as a family unit. You know, we're learning together. It's not like, hey, I want to teach you mindfulness. It's like, hey, you could even say, I want to learn how to take these deep breaths in a certain way, or I want to learn how to do mindful hearing, listening to audios and meditation, or a lot of different ways. But learning together, I think, is a key point so that your child thinks, oh, you're learning. I can learn with you, or I can even teach you. So it's not like the subtext isn't like, hey, you have a problem. I need to teach you mindfulness. It's like, hey, we're learning together. Yeah, and you've you've gone back to one of the things that you said in the very beginning that I loved, and it's part of the theme of the whole book is you got back to we. It goes back to Mm -hmm. we. We're not talking at them. We are talking with them about what we can do. And I think that's so huge for any family. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I want to touch on, and I I see that we're only got about four minutes. Um, I've had experts on the show. We've talked a little bit about, you know, what to do from the standpoint of school shootings. But unfortunately, they've become a sad reality in our culture in recent years. What is your advice or insight to offer parents about how to talk to their kids about these events or the fears that the kids may have in regards to it happening to them? Well, I think, you know, we're always afraid of the unknown, and especially if there's unknown that's scary, frightening. And I think that we have to bring children back to the present moment, say, okay, everything is well, you know, all is well in this moment, and I am doing everything you can to ensure that your school is safe and that I'm keeping you safe and that you have to help them understand that you've got their back and that their school is really being proactive. So you want to be honest and healthy with them. You want to help create a container and coping skills for scary things, whether it's the idea of a school shooting, whether it's the idea of a natural disaster, whether it's the idea of something just unknown happening, seeing someone in their classroom faint or have a seizure. I had a child recently have that. So you want to help them know that you're in it together and that you're doing everything you can to keep them safe and as well as their school is taking measures. So they need to know what's happening, but uh, I I wouldn't expose children to a lot of media that's scary. Well, yeah, for as much as we can control it, which now is is something that is very difficult to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. Maureen? I, I, I just really want to acknowledge you uh, for taking the time to not only come on the show, but for writing the books. And, and I think that you are really on to something from the standpoint we need to start working with, with people younger. Um, you know, w- waiting until, you know, there's a problem and waiting until you have a teenager that, that now is starting to get in trouble. You've waited too long. I mean, you know, start start young, give them the time that they need, and, and you're putting together these books and, and really expressing this to parents, I think, is something that will help our, our whole culture. I mean, it's going to help for every generation on, and I'm just so thankful that you're doing that. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your good words and, and for having me on. It's, it's helpful to get the message out and And, uh, you know, it brings me joy to do this type of work. So I'm happy to be here to do it. So what would your takeaway be uh, in regards to anyone uh, getting this book? What do you feel that that, uh, you would like to see them end up with? You know, I think that just the idea that emotional health is a skill to be learned. Sometimes I think we get stuck in thinking, oh, you know, I can't change or my child's already is too late. 
And it's a skill to be learned, and that's why I created the book, to give you the ideas and easy-to-use tools. Things aren't complicated, but they do have to be done consistently, certain things, and that we all can, you know, learn how to feel better, and eventually with our kids, they can do better. So this is, so now is the time. <laughs> well, you got that right. And mm-hmm. no, no matter what age we are, folks, now is the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so again, mm-hmm. thank you so much. And for everybody out there, please be sure to put us on your calendar and tune in next Monday when we will be joined by Dr. Bruce Olive Solheim to discuss his new book, Timeless, A Paranormal Personal History. And this kind of goes to what I said in the beginning when I said we're getting more people that are sending in suggestions and they're saying, we have, you haven't done a show on this. And again, my incredible producer, her name is Jan. She goes out there. She finds these wonderful people just like Maureen. And we're able to bring you this, this type of content. So um, if you're in agreement, go to the website. Let us know. And if you want to see some of the other things we've done, please visit our archives of past interviews. You can go to AnswersForTheFamily.com or you can subscribe to the show through iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube, and it'll get sent to you automatically. And remember, if you like what you hear, please leave a review and share it with somebody else. It will help us reach more people, and we greatly appreciate it. So for all of you out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. Listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on LA Talk Radio.
uh, enthusiasm or overexcited, you want to kind of come back to center and calm. And then three, you want to make a smart choice. So I define a smart choice as a choice good for you and good for others. For example, I had a child who got really angry and threw something across her classroom. That was good for her, but it was not good for others. So 